God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you this morning. So glad that you came to worship the Lord with us today. Thank you, Pastor Jason, Elizabeth, Dom. Didn't everyone do a great job leading us this morning? If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. I want to share with you for a few minutes this morning about believers baptism. Colossians chapter 2. Going to talk about believers baptism. Now I need you to help me out because I majorly, majorly blew it in the first service. Uh, we just had a week of the most incredible VBS and in the first service I was so eager to preach the word that I completely forgot to pause for a moment and say thank you to everyone who was part of our vacation Bible school. Um, so you got to help, we got to make up for it and, and, and we got to say thank you. If you were part of our vacation Bible school this year, if you served in any capacity, uh, if you were a participant, if, if there's anybody in the sanctuary uh, who was participated in any way in vacation Bible school, I need you to stand up very quickly. Uh, I need to say a huge thank you to my wife, Denise, to Pastor Kimberly Foster, and to everybody who was part of Vacation Bible School. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You may be seated. Do you know that we had over two, I never did get the final count, but we had over 220 kids that participated this year, and we had over 120 volunteers that helped out. So thank you everyone for making it a great VBS, and uh, help, help me out, uh, I gotta fix it with the, with the first service next week, so help me out with that. Uh, just before we look at Colossians chapter two, um, just want to give you a heads up about the schedule in the month of July. Uh, we change up a little bit. We will not have Royal Rangers and Missionettes on Wednesday evenings in the month of July. Uh, but we, built, we will be here every Wednesday. Uh, this Wednesday we are off because of the July 4th holiday. We will not be here uh, this Wednesday, July 4th. But we will be back on July 11th. Youth group will be meeting in the old sanctuary. Our friends Kurt Kanemeyer and Vivi have uh, agreed to help lead our youth along during these summer months, and we appreciate <clears throat> we appreciate Kurt and Vivi um, leading the kids while we're doing a search for a youth pastor for the next person to come serve our teenagers. We have a summertime kids program happening on the lower level. And we will have a summer pulpit series here in the sanctuary. We're going to have for the adults worship, a great word. And first on deck on Wednesday, July 11th, is our own Pastor Melanie Marza, who pastors our Spanish congregation. Uh, Pastor Melanie has a powerful, powerful testimony, and she always brings an amazing word. And so we'd love for you. We won't be here this Wednesday. But Wednesday, July 11th, we'll be back and we'll be meeting for the next several Wednesdays. And we hope you'll come out and join us for a great time of fellowship. All right, look with me. Um, I need to do one more thing. Is, is my friend Rick Amendola here in the sanctuary somewhere? There you, Pastor Rick, you're hiding way in the back. Would you stand, Pastor Rick? <clears throat> I want everybody to meet Pastor Rick Amendola. And Pam. Thank you, Pam. I didn't see you. I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> Stay standing if you would. Rick and Pam were our very first associate pastors at Harvest Time Church, and they served our congregation for a number of years, and uh, the Lord called Pastor Rick and Pam onto Massachusetts. They pastor uh, in Haverhill, Massachusetts. Did I say that right? Haverhill, Massachusetts. I got it close enough. All right. Well, it's up there in the north, and uh, they pastor there. When I came to Harvest Time, uh, I inherited Pastor Rick's desk, and so the anointing of Pastor Rick was all over my desk. I could feel it every time I sat down. Pastor Rick and Pam, we love you so much, and welcome. We're so glad. Please, let's just bless them. Uh, God bless. All right, let's get down to it. Colossians chapter 2, going to start reading in verse 8. Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. Paul says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spirits 
of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. Look at verse 11, because these are the verses that we're going to talk about specifically this morning. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to his cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. How many of you know that we serve a victorious Savior who has conquered our enemy? <clears throat> Let's pray and then I want to talk to you about believer's baptism. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence with us and for your powerful word. Your word is truth. Father, I pray that each one of us would encounter you this morning while we receive your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen. You know, when it comes to the ordinance of Christian baptism, people have some funny ideas. A day no pigs would die is a coming-of-age novel about a young boy named Robert Peck who grew up in poverty in Vermont. On one occasion, Robert's very pious and sanctimonious aunt chastises him for his poor grammar. She says to him, if you were a God-fearing Baptist, you would have better English. Young Robert reminisces, that there was the time that my heart stopped. I'd heard about the Baptists from Jacob's Henry's mother, According to her, Baptists were a strange lot. They put you in the water to see how holy you were. Then they dunked you under the water three times. Didn't matter a whit whether you could swim or not. If you didn't come up, you got dead. And your mortal soul went to hell. But if you did come up, it was even worse. You had to live as a Baptist for the rest of your life. I guess it's true what they say. Some Christians are so sour, they act as if they were baptized in lemon juice. I don't know whether young Robert ever got straightened out about water baptism, but I want you to be straight about believer's baptism. Next Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock, we're going to have a water baptism service in Ossining at the, friends of our, at the home of our friends Mark and Silveria Schultz. We have a number of people signed up for water baptism already, and there's still time for you to sign up. If you want to be baptized next Sunday, on either side of the main sanctuary doors, there's a welcome desk, and you can sign up there and get some instructions about what to do next. Right now, we're reading Paul's letter to the Christians in the Turkish city of Colossae. In Colossians 2, Paul has some interesting things to say about believer's baptism. I want to share with you quickly this morning three truths about believer's baptism. Three truths about believer's baptism. If you have not yet been baptized, I want you to listen and respond. If you have been baptized, I want you to remember and rejoice. Three truths about believer's baptism. First of all, believer's baptism is not a religious ritual. It is a heart response to God. On your way in, 
you might have received an outline at the door of this sermon. We're, we're waiting for our LED walls to come in. They're actually, I have good news, they're supposed to come into port tomorrow in Newark on July 2nd. So thank the Lord. Uh, we'll see how long it takes to get them from Newark here to Connecticut, uh, particularly with a holiday week. Uh, but they are supposed to arrive tomorrow, and uh, we're looking forward to getting them installed. In the meantime, we printed for you a sermon outline, and if you like, you can follow along and fill in the blanks and stay with us. Believer's baptism is not a religious ritual. It is a heart response to God. I was born into a Presbyterian family. I was christened. I was baptized as a baby. I wonder how many other people here this morning were also baptized as babies. Let me see your hand. Lift them up high. Wow. Uh, a major overwhelming majority. In the first service, it was the same way. Almost everybody. If you were baptized as a baby, I believe that it's meaningful to the extent that it was a sincere expression of faith on the part of your parents. If we're really honest, for a lot of young couples today, infant baptism is mostly an occasion to celebrate the arrival of a new child. At times, I've had parents approach me here at Harvest Time for a baby dedication, and I can kind of tell that they're not really too focused on the spiritual aspect of it. They're just looking forward to the party afterwards. You know, I used to get mad about that. But I decided a long time ago, I'm never going to turn down an opportunity to hold a baby in my hands and to bless that baby in the name of Jesus. Some couples don't really have a strong conviction about baptizing their babies, but they do it to please their parents. They do it to keep tradition. They do it to keep the peace. For some couples, infant baptism is motivated by fear. We have to get the baby baptized so that he or she don't, won't go to limbo. Beloved, I want to tell you that there is no such thing as limbo. It is not in the Bible. Don't mean any disrespect to anybody, but you will not find it there. When children die before the age of accountability, they go directly to the Lord. David and Paul and Jesus affirm that. When people of mature understanding die, they go either to heaven or to hell, depending on whether or not they have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Your eternal destiny does not rest on a religious ritual, particularly not on one that was done to you before you even knew what was going on. For some couples, infant baptism is a sincere expression of their Christian faith. They have a sincere desire to see their child grow up, to know the Lord, to, to, to be in the fear of the Lord, the instruction of the Lord. That They have a sincere desire for their child to be a follower of Christ and, and a part of the church. And that is sincerely meaningful, but it is not the same thing as believers' baptism in the Bible. Infant baptism is not the baptism that was administered by John, nor commanded by Jesus, nor preached by Peter and Paul, nor practiced by the early church. Infant baptism is a religious ritual. Believer's baptism is a heart response to God. These verses in Colossians 2 are actually critical for the debate between infant baptism and believer's baptism. Those who administer infant baptism believe that Paul teaches in these verses that water baptism is the New Testament equivalent of circumcision in the Old Testament. And since the Jews circumcise infants, they believe that we as Christians should baptize infants. But looking more closely at, at verses 11 and 12 of Colossians 2, Paul does not equate Old Testament circumcision with baptism. Paul equates Old Testament circumcision with an inner spiritual experience. Paul calls it a circumcision not made with hands. 
water baptism as administered with our hands. It's a physical experience. Next Sunday, we're going to water baptize a bunch of people, and with our hands, we're going to lower them down into the water. We're going to hold them there just for a second, and if we like them, we're going to bring them back up again. That is, is something administered with our hands. But Paul says this is a spiritual experience whereby we undergo an inner transformation. Something is cut away from us, not a piece of our physical flesh, but our old sinful nature, the way that we used to be. In his letter to the Romans, Paul calls this a circumcision of the heart. It, it happens during a defining moment of believing on Jesus. While the gospel is being shared, whether it's over a pulpit like this one, or whether it's over a cafe table with a Christian friend, while someone is telling the gospel, God sends the gift of faith, saving faith into people's hearts, and he opens their hearts, and he enables them to believe. And in that moment, there is a transformation of the heart. That is the New Testament equivalent of circumcision. In verse 13, Paul says something even more. He says that water baptism is only effective when it is administered to someone who has personal faith. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul makes that same connection between faith and baptism. He wrote, in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Beloved, baptism is absolutely useless if it is approached merely as a religious ritual. That's why John the Baptist refused the Pharisees who came to him at the Jordan River. They wanted to participate in baptism as a ritual. But everyone must approach the waters of baptism with his or her own personal faith. Otherwise, all you get is wet. A baby doesn't have faith of his or her own yet. And the surrogate faith of the parents doesn't meet the biblical prerequisite. Believer's baptism is a heart response to God. When the Pharisees came out to the Jordan River, John the Baptist told them, first, produce fruit consistent with repentance, and then come and be baptized. John was saying to them, this is not some newfangled religious ritual going on here. This is a genuine heart response to God. This is people turning back to God. This is people getting right with God. This is people restoring their broken relationship with God, restoring their lost connection with him. Believer's baptism is an instinctive heart response that follows a change in your heart. When Jesus changes your heart, there is something inside of you that wants to get in that water. You know, that's the way it was for the royal Ethiopian official in Acts chapter 8. This royal official had traveled all the way to Jerusalem to worship in the Jewish temple. While he was in Jerusalem, he acquired a scroll of the prophet Isaiah, a very rare, a very precious, very costly acquisition to add to the treasury of Queen Candace. On the way home in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah 53 but he didn't understand it. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. As a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. The Holy Spirit sent Philip out for a jog on that same deserted road that that royal official was traveling. Philip ran up alongside the chariot and he said, do you understand what you're reading? The Ethiopian official said to him, Tell me, who is the prophet Isaiah talking about? And Philip shared with him the good news about Jesus. And somewhere along that deserted road, the Ethiopian official believed. And when they came upon some water, he said, Here is some water. Baptize me. 
That is the instinctive response of a heart that has believed on Jesus. Here is some water. Baptize me. My parents had me baptized as an infant. And I'm sure that it reflected a, a meaningful expression of faith on their part. But I was baptized as a believer in Jesus when I was almost 10 years old. And it was a moment of pure heart response to God. Back in the 1970s, there were these massive outdoor gatherings. They were called the Jesus Festivals. They were like Christian Woodstock. 50, 60, 70,000 people would gather together in the cornfields of Pennsylvania. There was worship and preaching on a big open air stage. There were big circus tents where they had different kinds of ministry. One afternoon, my mom took my sister Lisa to one of the tents to receive prayer for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I went down to the lake by myself to watch the water baptism. There were literally hundreds of people getting water baptized. And I only went to watch, but as I stood there, my heart started pounding and I wanted to get water baptized so badly. I don't know how many pastors there were in the water baptizing, but at one point, one man locked eyes with mine and he reached out his hand like this to me. When I get to heaven, I'm going to find him. And I'm going to thank him for his sensitivity to the Holy Spirit in that moment. I wasn't even 10 years old yet. My mom wasn't there to ask permission. I didn't know if I would get in trouble. I didn't have a baptism class. I didn't have a theology of baptism. I didn't have a baptismal gown. I didn't even have a bathing suit on. I didn't have a towel and I didn't care. I had to get baptized. I walked straight out of my shoes and straight into the water. Dads and moms, I want to say this to you. Even if your child is young, if she, he or she expresses a real urgency to get baptized, go with that. Thank you for that golf clap. Believers, baptism is not a religious ritual. It is a heart response to God. Here is some water. Baptize me. I believe that there might be somebody here and maybe you have that inner desire to get baptized, but fear has held you back. You're afraid of replacing your infant baptism. You're afraid of invalidating membership in another church. Maybe you're afraid of dishonoring your parents. Listen, their sincere expression of faith was meaningful, but now it's your turn to express your own faith in Jesus and follow him in believer's baptism. You can tell your parents, Mom, Dad, this is something different. This is believer's baptism. Three truths about believer's baptism. Number one, it's a heart response to God. Number two, believer's baptism is not merely symbolic. It is a significant spiritual transaction. It's not merely symbolic. If you were raised in an evangelical church, maybe you were taught that baptism is only symbolic. We say baptism is an outward sign of an inward change. And it's true. We say that it's a symbol of the death of our old man and our recreation in Christ. It's a testimony to others that we've made a commitment to follow Jesus. Baptism surely is all of those things, but it is not only that. Believer's baptism is an act of humble obedience that actually accomplishes something inside of us. What does believer's baptism accomplish? First of all, it's an act of identification with Jesus that helps to kill and bury our sinful nature. John the Baptist believed that his baptism actually accomplished something. That's why he stopped the unrepentant Pharisees from receiving baptism. That's also why he tried to stop Jesus from receiving baptism. 
Do you remember what happened? Jesus came to the Jordan and John recognized him as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus didn't need to repent. He didn't need to turn back to God. He didn't need to be reconciled to the Father. He was the spotless Lamb of God. God made him to become sin for us on the cross. The one who knew no sin. John tried to stop Jesus. He said, no, Lord, this is not appropriate. I need you to administer baptism of fire to me. But Jesus said, do it now, John. It is necessary for us to fulfill all righteousness. What do those words mean? Why did Jesus get baptized? Well, in his baptism, Jesus was fulfilling the Old Testament. He was fulfilling the prophecies about God's righteous servant. God said, my righteous servant will justify many. He will bear their iniquities. He will, he will pour out his life unto death and be, num listen, numbered among the transgressors. When Jesus was baptized, he fully identified with sinners. He identified with the penitent. He identified with the poor in spirit, those who mourn over their sins. He identified with the humble, with those who are spiritually hungry and thirsty, longing to be obedient to God's will, longing to be reconciled to the Father. Paul wrote, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient in every way. His baptism was one of the ways that he was obedient. Hebrews says he wasn't ashamed to call us brothers. He shared in our humanity and became like us in every way in order that he might become a merciful high priest. Jesus' baptism was just one of those ways that he became like us. Maybe you've heard stories of kids fighting cancer. Maybe you've known someone yourself. And as that young cancer patient loses his hair or her hair as a sign of solidarity the parents or a sibling or maybe a circle of friends will shave their heads it's a sign of of solidarity they don't have cancer but but they're identifying with the struggle of someone they love who does in water baptism Jesus shaved his head as it were he wasn't sick with sin but he showed solidarity with we who are sick with sin. Jesus didn't have to repent of anything, but in receiving baptism, he fully identified with our sinful humanity, and then he went and he died in our place on the cross. Beloved, I want you to listen this, to this. Jesus was baptized to identify with us with our sinful humanity and we get baptized in order to identify with him in order to identify with his glorious victory over sin and here's where the shaved head metaphor falls short you see a friend can shave his head to show solidarity with a cancer patient but he can do absolutely nothing to cure the cancer Jesus on the other hand has cured our terminal sin sickness through his cross <laughs> baptism is more than just an outward symbol it's a sacred act of obedient humility of identification with Jesus when we go down into that water we identify with his death and, and our sinful nature is crucified with him while we're under that water our sin nature is buried with him and when we come up out of that water we arise to what Paul calls newness of life just like Naaman the leper in the Old Testament. Do you remember him? Something happens when we enter the waters of baptism in faith. Naaman received an outward physical cleansing. We receive an inward spiritual cleansing from sin. Beloved, bondages to sin wash off 
in the waters of baptism. Addictions wash off in the waters of baptism. Sinful habits, self-destructive thought patterns, social awkwardness, isolation, self-loathing, we are cleansed in the waters of baptism. Going back to college days, I, I had a good friend that the Lord delivered from heavy drugs. He was instantly set free from major drug addiction when he came to Jesus, but he had a lingering addiction to pot. He would toke up, and the next day he would be full of remorse. He would destroy his stash, and he would repent. He would tell God, I will never do it again. And a few days later, he was right back at it again. Anybody else know what it's like to ride that merry-go-round? Paul did. He said, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do are the very things I end up doing. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And the enemy began to, to play with my friend's mind. He began to taunt him. You see, this isn't real. You're not really changed. Finally, our church was having a water baptism service. And he cried out. He said, God, if this is real, you have to deliver me from pot at my baptism. He went down into the waters of baptism, addicted to pot. But when he was lowered into the water, he identified with Jesus' death. While he was under that water just for a moment, he, he identified with Jesus' burial. And when he was raised up again, God delivered him from pot. <laughs> you know, that was over 30 years ago, and he's still drug-free and loving Jesus today. What does believer's baptism accomplish? It's an act of identification with Jesus. And it's a powerful spiritual encounter. Believer's baptism removes the barrier between heaven and us. Remember when Jesus was baptized, the heavens were opened up. The veil between the physical world and the spiritual world was taken away. Jesus could see God clearly. He could hear God's voice. The very next words were, the Holy Spirit led Jesus. In the very same way, believer's baptism opens up our spirit to the heavenly realm. It opens up our spiritual eyes. It opens up our spiritual ears. It increases our capacity to perceive God's presence, to comprehend spiritual truths. It increases our capacity to receive God's guidance. You know, that's the theology that is designed into this sanctuary through the cross of Jesus Christ. The barrier between us and God has been removed and now there's an open heaven open over our heads. What does believer's baptism accomplish? It's a powerful encounter. It releases the anointing of the Holy Spirit on us. Do you remember when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended and it rested upon him like a dove. And in baptism, we also received the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote about it in Galatians 3. He says, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. The word Christ means the anointing. And so when we receive baptism, we receive a, another measure of the Holy Spirit's anointing, specifically anointing for ministry believers baptism releases the father's affirmation on you in baptism the father affirmed Jesus and the father affirms us too do you remember what the father said when Jesus was baptized he said this is my son I love him I'm pleased with him. And in baptism we become inwardly assured of the father's love for us too it makes us secure, it, it makes us significant, it makes us whole, it, it makes us impervious to rejection. Go ahead, say whatever you want about me. My Father, He loves me. Yeah. Believers, baptism releases joy on you. 
Walk through the book of Acts and you'll discover that every time someone was baptized, it was accompanied by joy. In Jerusalem, when 3,000 people were baptized on the day of Pentecost, there was joy. In Samaria, when they believed and baptized, there was joy. After he was baptized, the Ethiopian official went home to Ethiopia full of joy. The Philippian jailer, Lydia, joy, joy, joy. When you're baptized in abiding joyfulness, comes and rests on your spirit. I still remember the encounter I had at baptism. I remember going down into the water. I remember coming back up again. I remember hugging people I didn't even know on the shore. I remember how I, I felt walking back to our campsite, dripping wet. I remember feeling joyful and changed. I remember feeling close to God. I remember feeling more committed in my love for Jesus and more bold about it. I remember knowing in that moment that I was called to serve God in ministry. I'm looking forward to next Sunday afternoon. Mark and Silveria, thank you for so graciously opening up your home to us. I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait because I know what's about to happen in the lives of every person that receives water baptism. And I'm so excited for them. Three truths about believer's baptism. Number one, it's not a ritual. It's a heart response. Number two, not just a symbol. It's a significant transaction. Finally, this. Worship team, you can come help me finish. Believer's baptism, everybody look, 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 look at me. Believers, look at me. Believer's baptism is not optional. It is an essential part of our Christian conversion. Beloved, it is not optional. It's essential. It was demonstrated by Jesus. It was commanded by him. And it was taught and it was practiced by the early church. Truth is, is we're just a little too casual about believers' baptism. We've become just a little too nonchalant about it. Part of it is a lack of teaching. Part of it is our culture. Here at Harvest Time, part of it is driven by the fact that for 34 years, we never had a baptismal tank. We have one now. It's right behind me in the platform. We're going to crack it open a little later this year. You might be wondering, why are we not using it next week? Well, our construction manager, Tim, told us it's not quite ready yet. So we haven't tested it. We haven't put water in it yet. So we, we, need, we need to do a little more work and make sure it's ready to go. So we're going to go to a pool. But, but the truth is, we're, we're just a little too casual about baptism. In the old days, and still all around the world today, believers get baptized baptized as soon as possible after believing and that's the way it should be in Maine as soon as someone received Jesus they used to go straight down to the river and put him in at any time of year even if they had to break the ice to dunk him and it's that way in most places in the world today for years I've, I've announced water baptismal services and I've said if you've never been baptized prayerfully consider it you know what that's baloney you don't have to ever pray about obeying Jesus you have to just do it I've altered my announcements from henceforth and forevermore if you've never been baptized in water since becoming a believer in Jesus I want you to obey him and join us next Sunday afternoon Water baptism isn't optional. It's an essential part of our conversion experience. It's essential to Christian discipleship. It's essential to our Christian walk, to our ministry. It's essential to following Jesus. Before he ascended to the Father, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, the people of Jerusalem cried out under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, what must we do to be saved? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And listen, I love this. 
Peter said, this promise is for you, it's for your children, and it's for all who are far off that the Lord will call their salvation. 3,000 people were baptized that day. When the Samaritans believed, they were baptized in water. When the Ethiopian official believed, he was baptized in water. When the Gentiles at Cornelius' house believed, they were baptized in water. When Lydia believed, she was baptized in water along with her whole house. When the Philippian jailer believed, he was baptized in water with his whole family. When the Corinthians believed, they were baptized in water. When the Ephesians believed, more than 20 years after the day of Pentecost, they were baptized in water. When Paul was knocked off of his high horse and became a believer, he was baptized in water. Ananias said to him, and now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, calling on his name. Maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to someone this morning. What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Three truths about believer's baptism. Not a ritual, a response to God. Not a symbol, a significant transaction. Not optional an essential part of our faith. Now, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized, calling on the name of Jesus. Would you stand to your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place today. Oh, come on, give him a great big praise. one moment for our final act of worship today we're going to share at the Lord's table but I want us to just take one moment and pray before we do that we during worship we were singing a chorus that says I'm no longer a slave to fear I'm a child of God would you lift it up let's sing oh, I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child your heads with me for just one moment we're going to conclude our service in just a moment by sharing at the Lord's table but just before we do 
I want to pray a prayer of believing with you. Rituals don't save us. They never have. They never could. They never will. Communion, the ritual of communion doesn't save us. Water baptism as a ritual doesn't save us. There's a defining moment of believing on Jesus. It happens while the gospel is being shared. God sends the gift of saving faith into our hearts. He opens our hearts. He enables us to believe. Maybe there's someone here this morning, not going to embarrass you in any way, but, but maybe as we were sharing this morning, something just jumped in your heart a little bit. Maybe you, you felt something stirring in your heart. Maybe you even felt like you might want to cry for a moment. That was the Holy Spirit. And the way we respond to that is with a prayer of believing. Just a moment, I'm going to lead in a prayer of believing, not going to embarrass you, going to just ask you to stand right where you are. But while heads are bowed all over this place, I wonder if there's someone, you, you felt something move in your heart while we were sharing during this service today, and you want to respond by praying a prayer of believing. That's where it all begins. It all begins with putting your faith on Jesus. While heads are bowed, is there someone here this morning and you'd like to say that prayer with us? I'd like to ask you just to lift your hand real high wherever you are. There's one, there's two, there's another. Someone else, I'd like to pray that prayer of believing. Would you lift your hand real high wherever you are? Just lift your hand up real high. I'd like to pray that prayer of believing. Not going to embarrass you. We're going to pray it all together. Someone else, lift your hand high. I'd like to pray a prayer of believing. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, someone else, you want to pray that prayer with us? Lift your hand. There's another one. Someone else, you want to pray that prayer believing with us? I'm going to ask everyone, if you're willing, would you lift up your hands with us? And I'm going to lead in a prayer, and I want to invite everybody to follow with a nice, clear voice. You might have prayed this prayer many times or a long time ago, but it feels good to pray it again. And we're going to help some people just respond to, to the moving of God in their heart with the prayer believing. Let's, let's pray. I'll lead you follow in a nice clear voice. Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your only son. Jesus, thank you for coming. You lived a perfect life for me. You died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, change me. Take away my old nature. Forgive my sins. Make me a new person. Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and I confess you as the leader of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and give the Lord a praise this morning. Listen, if you, if you prayed that prayer for the first time this morning, or maybe for the first time in a long time, as soon as this service is over, our pastors are going to be right here at the front, standing right across, and we want to invite you to come. We just want to celebrate with you. We want to pray a prayer of blessing over you before you go on. If you're a believer in Jesus and you haven't yet been water baptized, follow Jesus in this step of obedience. Sign up at the welcome desks on either side of the main front doors and then meet us next Sunday. For our final act of worship, we're going to come to the Lord's table. I'm going to ask those that are waiting on us if you'd come to serve. If you're a believer in Jesus, we invite you to this table. In just a moment, we're going to invite you to leave your seat, come down the aisle, and receive a serving of communion. We have a cup with a serving of juice in it. There's a foil cover on top of it. Over that is a wafer under a plastic cover. It's just one serving. You can take that, take it back to your seat. And when everyone's been served, we're going to receive together. There might be someone in our service this morning, and physically, 
it's a little bit of a challenge to walk all the way around Jericho. Just ask your neighbor if uh, he or she will bring a serving of communion back to your seat, and they'll be happy to bring it back. God bless you while you come. When everyone's been served, we're going to receive together. Uh, the word in the New Testament for communion is thanksgiving. So I want you to come with thanksgiving in your heart. God bless you. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. And I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. And I'm to the Corinthians, I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was handed over took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's give thanks. Father, thank you that you so loved us that you gave your only son, Jesus. Lord, thank you that his body was broken so we might be made whole in every way. Lord, thank you that his body was broken so that we might receive healing in our bodies and unity in our church body. Father, thank you for the precious blood of Jesus that washes us whiter than snow. Thank you for your promise that if we confess our sins to you, you're faithful and just, not only to forgive our sins, but to also cleanse us from sin. So Lord, by faith in the cross of Jesus Christ, we receive everything purchased for us on Calvary. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen. Let's receive communion. You may receive the bread and after that receive the cup. Thank you, Jesus. After you've received the bread, go ahead and receive the cup. church would you just give him some thanks this morning we thank you Jesus we thank you Jesus we thank you Jesus just lift up your faces I, I know your hands are full lift up your faces and would you just receive the refreshing of the Lord this morning Holy Spirit come refresh your people Holy Spirit come refresh our weary minds come refresh our weary spirits Holy Spirit come refresh our, our, our frayed emotions, our played out emotions. Holy Spirit, come refresh us. And our bodies refresh us. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Come on, would you just say thank you to him? We thank you, O oh Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. The ushers are coming. They're going to pass a container down your row. You can put your empty communion cup in the container as it goes by you. Would you lift up what we were singing? You are my King, Jesus. Jesus, you wish you a very happy and safe 4th of July. Pray that you have a good holiday uh, and the Lord just watches over you. Remember, we're not here this Wednesday. We'll be here the following Wednesday. If you'd like to be part of water baptism next week, you can sign up at the welcome desk on either side of the main front door for our 
benediction. I want you to hug two or three or ten people and just bless them in the name of the Lord. If anybody would like to receive prayer, we'll be right here at the front to pray with you. God bless you. God be with you. Have a great week in Jesus. Oh,